<laughs> Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good morning, buen dia, and all that stuff. Let's take our seats, and we'll go ahead and begin with the service today. Uh, today's parsha is Bo, just to go, and Torah portion is in Shemot, Exodus chapter 10. Parsha begins with the Lord speaking to Moshe, saying, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. Moshe and Aharon go to Pharaoh and do as the Lord said and warn him, saying, Else, if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast. He told him they would cover everywhere and eat the residue of that which escaped. Pharaoh tells them the men could go, but Moshe said, we will go with our young, with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, with our flocks, and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. Pharaoh refused, and Moshe stretched out his rod over Mitzrayim, Egypt, and the locusts came. They covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which, had, which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or the herbs of the field through all all the land of Egypt. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again after he removed the locusts from the land and Pharaoh did the same as before even after the Lord sent a thick darkness throughout Egypt. Finally the Lord said he would send one more plague and then Pharaoh would thrust them out. This was the plague of death of the firstborn in Egypt and the Lord said for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Now God had the people established this month, I'm sorry, that month as the beginning of the month, and the Passover was established. They were to take a lamb without blemish or male goat and the blood of it, after it was killed, was to be struck on the side doorpost and the upper doorpost. This was a token, and the Lord would pass over them so that the plague wouldn't destroy them. This memorial was established with them and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and God gave specific instructions on keeping these feasts. The plague of death of the firstborn came, and there was not a house in Egypt where at least one was not dead. Pharaoh had Moshe and Aharon get the people out of the land. And they did, and they borrowed from their neighbors the wealth of gold and jewelry, and they left in haste with all they took and along with them, with a mixed multitude, and God <clears throat> and the God of the people gave the people ordinances, and also said, Sanctify me all the firstborn, for whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. The half to portion comes from Jeremiah, Jeremiah forty six, where we read the word of the Lord coming to the prophet that Nebuchadnezzar would come from Babylon and smite the land of Egypt. He warns of its coming fall. And the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saith, Behold, I will punish the multitude of No and Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh and all them that trust in him. He also says, But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. The Rit Kadashah portion is from 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, where Rav Shal, Paul, talks about the night of the Passover of Hamashiach. He warns, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, among the people, many are weak, sick, and die. Now we see God executed judgment on the ten gods of Egypt, Pharaoh and Egypt itself. We see him bring his people out of captivity. Our God is faithful, and we see his separation between his people and those who are not his people. And he shows how he wants us to deem holy and sacred that which he deems holy and sacred. And because of what he has done for us, to us and with us, let us remember to obey and be faithful unto him, our God. Amen. Shofarim.
praise you, Father. Praise you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that we can stand before you and that we can be worthy, Lord, to stand before you. That you forgive us of all our sins because of the blood of the Lamb. Thank you for the blood that's over our homes and over our doorposts, Lord, as we enter into our houses. And over this place, Lord God, I thank you for your blood covering. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you have been with us throughout this week, Lord God. And Lord, yes, there has been sick, Father, among us, but Lord, you allowed us to recover, Lord, and be strong. I thank you for that, Lord God, for being with us through sickness. Because we know, Lord God, in this world, we're going to have to deal with sickness, Lord. But you cause us to recover from it, Lord. I praise your holy name this morning. I thank you, Lord God, that you have allowed us to hear the sound in the mulberry bushes, Lord God, that we know, Lord God, when to rise and go when you say go. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given us your holy scriptures, Lord, as a map that we can go to your word and we know when to speak, Lord, and when not to speak. I thank you and praise you for your anointing, Lord God, upon this congregation, upon the people, Lord God, that have moved in truth this week and have touched lives. Continue, Lord God, to touch everyone in this place, Lord God, and use us for your kingdom in these last days. I give you honor this morning and glory because you deserve it, Lord. And I thank you and praise you that you will anoint the word as it comes forth. And you will feed us from your table this morning. And you will reach out your hand and you will touch those in need, Lord God, that need a touch from heaven. Blessed be your holy name, Lord, and glory be unto you. Thank you for all you do for us, and thank you for moving in this service today. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen, amen. Let us stand together. For how lovely the tents of Jacob and the dwelling places of Israel. Matovu. Shaft in my best of some, me, my nay, I yes, you were. Shaft in my best of some, me, my nay, I yes, you were. My, 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 oh, my best of some, my, 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 oh, my best of some. Hey, hey, oh, my, 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 my best of some, my. My am I am my am my am Bessasom. Therefore, with joy we shall draw water from the wells of Yeshua. Amen, amen. You may be seated. All right, Shabbat Shalom. All right, we begin this door with the Baruchu. Baruchu et Adonai Hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vai Ed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. 
The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Blessing of Mashiach Yeshua together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Et Derek HaYeshua BaMashiach Yeshua Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, Messiah Yeshua. Amen. We all stand for the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavon Malkuto Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Gavon, Malkuto, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. We have to et Adonai Lohecha, Bokol Levavkov, Kol Nafshechav, Kol Madaka. Vahayu Hadvarim Ha'ele, Asher Anukim, Atavka Hayom, Al Levavaka. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Avraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov, the great, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God who bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindnesses of the fathers, and brings a redeemer to his children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Avraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord, the resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save, who sustains the living with kindness, resurrects the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? Our God and God of our fathers, may be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us in your commandments and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness and make us rejoice in your salvation and purify our hearts to serve you in truth. In love and favor, O Lord our God, grant us your holy Shabbat as a heritage. May Israel, who sanctifies your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, mekadesh ha-Shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. 
magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel in swiftly and soon and all say, let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he, though he be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and all say, May you make peace in his high places, make peace upon us, upon all Israel, and say, Amen. Amen. Yet Barak wished to pack with Paar with Mamma, Vina save at the door with a lever to Lel, Schmedukur Shabrihu. Leon in Korbakata, Vishra to Tushbakata, Venekamata Damiram, Bama Vimru. Amen. O say Shalom Vimrama, who ya say Shalom Ali, a new. Vea ko Yisrael, vimru, imru, amen. O say shalom, vimru, mav, hu ya say shalom, aleinu, vea ko Yisrael. Vimru, Vimru, Amen. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Viyako Yisrael. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu. We are called Israel. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, we are called Israel. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, we are called Israel. May he who makes peace in high places. Make peace for Israel and for all mankind and say, Amen, Amen. amen.
Every imposter, every contender will fail to compare with you. There is no kingdom, authority, power like yours. And no one's more royal, no one's more loyal than one God, one truth. No other kingdom, no other freedom like yours. You are high, oh, high lifted up, oh, strong and mighty enough. You are king, and I am covered by your wings. It's a fight for me. Silence is scattered by you. And your people rising when we realize that it's finished. It's finished. Stand in the promise. It is accomplished by you. You are right. Your high lifted up. Strong and mighty enough. You are king. And we that you be moved. That you be high and lifted up in this place, Father God. <laughs> Flow like a river Burn like fire in my soul, Lord. Oh, move in your power. Come breathe on me. Make me burn for you. Oh, below like a river. Burn like fire in my soul. I don't know. 
the song is within me, within my bones, release my praise, it's yours alone, my heart's overwhelmed with all you've done, I love you Lord with all I am, I don't know. Praise you, O oh God. Praise you, our King. We worship you this day. We come before you, Father. We come laying our crowns at our feet, surrendering all that we are, and acknowledging you as King, as King of this world, as King of our hearts. We just want to please you, Father. We want to bless you. Come and inhabit the, our praises, O oh God. Come and dwell with us, be with us. Let your glory fall upon this people that stands before you faithfully. Open up the heavens, O oh God, and pour out your word today. Give the words that you desire your people to hear today to Rabbi. Touch his lips, God, and let your anointing fall. Let your word come and burn within us, O oh God. Change each heart today, O oh God. Thank you, Father, for this day, for this Shabbat that you have made for us. Thank you that we have the freedom to come into this place. Thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us every day. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. You are such an awesome God. There is none like you, and we just bless you and worship you. This morning, Yeshua's name. Amen. Vahib ben Zawa Aharon. When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them hate you that flee and flee from you. 
For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Yamod Yoel ben Avraham la Torah. Baruch et Adonai hamvarach. Baruch Adonai hamvarach leolam vayed. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher bakar binu mekol ahamin. Yunatan lanu et Torah to. Baruch atah Adonai notain ha Torah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Yiladim. Good morning. <laughs> Boker well, Tov, Yella Dean. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that a hedge of protection be placed around each and every one of them to keep them away from the sickness, keep them away from harm's way. Lord, that you would have your hand upon each and every one of them when they reach that age of understanding, O oh Lord, that they would come to realize, Yeshua, who you are to them. They would receive you, Lord, and that they would grow and mature in the faith and that you would surround them with godly men and women who will assist them on their life's journey. They're such a blessing to us, O oh Lord, and we thank you for them, O oh Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Adonai, El Moshe, Bo el paro ki ani hikbadti et libo vet lev avadaiv lemaan shiti ototai ele bakirbo ulmaan tsaper baazne vinka uven binka et asher hitalalti bimitzrayim vet ototai asher samti vam vaditam ki ani adonai vayavo moshe vaacharon el Paro, Vamru Elav, Ko Amar, Adonai Elohe, Ha Ivrim Ad Matai, Maane La Not, Mipane Shalach, Ami Abba Abduni. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go into unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's sons what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Amen. Amen. The blessing after the Torah reading. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu toredi met, v'kaye olam natah bechotenu, baruch atah Adonai notain ha Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Vizot ha Torah, Asher Samoshe Lifne Bene Israel, Al Piadonai Biad Moshe. 
And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God, and Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's Word is written on lamb's skin, and Yeshua is this Lamb. In John 12, 32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitz Chaim hi l'machaz dekim bar, v'tonkehar mushar darche ar darche noam, v'kol nativoteha shalom, hashavenu Adonai elecha, as a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways, our ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you. Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2.7 reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And Yeshua was, he is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat Shalom. All right, well, I'm having technical difficulties. Go figure. All right, froze up. Okay, so today's parsha is Bo. This is an interesting parsha. If you read the uh, when you read the when you read the first portion in your in your uh, you know King James version or in your New American Standard version or your uh, NIV version, you know, when you read the first verse of the, of 10, chapter 10, verse one of Shemot, it really kind of doesn't express the way it reads in Hebrew. Um, we were talking about it last night because the, you know, God tells, God tells Moshe, Come to Pharaoh. That's why we get the word bow. Bow means come, masculine. Boe is feminine. He says, come to Pharaoh and basically tell him of these signs that I will bring to Egypt to magnify myself, to make myself look holy and, and, and to make him look weak. And, uh, you know, Tasha said last night that, you know, it's interesting that when you read the scripture, when you read this parasha, that it, it always kind of makes her feel funny because God's basically hardening somebody's heart and he's not softening it. You know, he's not softening the heart of this man. Well, why would God not soften his heart? Would God not want everyone to come to him? Well, the reality is, is that God knows the heart of man, right? And God knows the intention of the heart and that this man's heart would never change. So he continued to harden it. But I was 
I was thinking about when I was a kid, you know, there's, there was kids that used to mess with you or used to pick on other kids and you used to want to, in layman's terms or in terms from when I was a young kid in the late 80s, early 90s, we used to say, we're going to punk him. You used to want to punk the kids that were that way. You used to want to make them look like punks to everybody else. And then you would respond, when you make them look like a punk, you'd respond, now what? That was the normal response. Literally, when you read this from a literal translation, it almost sounds like God saying, now what? It's a totally different way of viewing it. But the most interesting portion of this scripture is God takes control here. For 400 years, the children of Israel are in slavery. And he wasn't doing anything about it. And call it slavery, call it they were just in, in a indentured servant environment, call it whatever you will. I mean, they still had lives. They had homes. We know they had homes. They had cattle. We know they had cattle. They had sheep. We know they had sheep. How do we know that? Here, Pharaoh asks Moshe in this passage, what will go with you? It's, he actually, in the literal translation, it says, who and who will go with you? Meaning like, what, who of the people, who of the flock, who and who will go with you? He says, we're going to take our young and we're going to take our elderly. And we're going to take our cattle and we're going to take our sheep. And Moshe and Pharaoh gets mad and he yells and screams and he says, get out of my sight and gets angry, but it was all part of the plan. God knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to try to be strong and that he was going to have to punk him, if you will. But it's interesting, for 400 years he allows them to be in this situation or in the world, the situation that is uh, where arguably he, he, I'm sure he was probably speaking to them, but he wasn't speaking to them in the way that he was going to speak to them after he pulls them out. Imagine, you know, for longer than the United States has been a country, they were in Egypt living. Their whole world was Egypt. And they didn't have the Torah. They didn't have the ways of God. They didn't have the commands. They just knew they were children of this man named Abraham that believed in this one true God. And God allowed that environment for a long, long time. But then all of a sudden, he took control. And he raises this guy up, Moshe, and uh, he puts him in a position to lead them. But nothing Moses did was of his own accord. Even in today's society, we revere Moses as one of the, be the greatest prophets of God, the most holy of God in today's Jewish society, and, and probably, you know, in Christianity too, they probably believe that Moses was probably one of the greatest prophets ever. But for sure, Judaism believes that he is the greatest prophet and the most holy. No one could be as holy as Moses. And the reality was because Moses was the one chosen to go to the tip top of the mountain. No one else was after that or before that. So clearly it's justified to consider Moshe as one of the holiest or if not the holiest man that walked the earth aside from Yeshua or Mashiach. So here Moses really doesn't do anything himself. God starts to intervene in his life and you know, I can't imagine this, you know, this week we've been, you think about the world that's around us, the world's a mess, and we can get confused by it. I had a nice Shabbat talk with Eliana last night, and since she's a bat mitzvah, right, she's a daughter of the commandments, it's time for her on Shabbat to learn the different commandments of God.
and why we do what we do and who we are and why we believe the way we believe. So we had a Shabbat talk and we're going to do that every Shabbat. And it's time for her to start digging into the Bible and reading it and becoming one with it and becoming one with God, starting to listen to him, right? She's of the age where she has to seek him. And I, we talked about the world that's around us and how confusing the world is. It's a, it's a confused mess, and it can get you, caught, you can get caught up in it. We fail to give God time, usually. It, people fail to give God time because they're so inundated with life and the things around about us. We push him off. But you know, it's funny, the, the last time I talked about, the last time I, I uh, was up here was probably at, at Eliana's bat mitzvah. And I talked about circles of time versus linear time and all those things that go on. And, and you know, when you sit back and you think about life, when I was young, I wanted, light, I wanted time to go fast because I was, I was running towards something. It's funny, the older I get, I want time to slow down. I want time to go slow. I want to have enough time to experience all the things. But it's not, I don't want it to go slow because of my personal ambitions. I want it to go slow because of, you know, I want to be with my family, see things, be around events, you know. I mean, my mom said something to me was morbid the other day. I sent her a picture of me. Snapchat has this little photo app that you can take a picture of yourself and it look, makes you look old. Shows you as you are when you're old. So I took this photograph of myself and it looks funny. I look like a fisherman, like I'd be wearing a yellow, you know, raincoat with a hat going out, you know, catching kosher shrimp. And I sent it to my mom and, and uh, you know, it looks like it would, like could be me, legit. That is what I could look like when I'm old. And my mom said, I'm so glad you sent that to me because I won't be around to see you then. And I about wanted to freaking flip out. I said, Mom, I said, who, who says things like that? What planet are we on? I don't want to hear anything like that. And she goes, I said, that's, uh, what did I, I forget what I said. I said, that's uh, morbid or something. And she goes, What's morbid? Getting old? Or, you know? Well, yeah, it is. Because time is changing. But with the changing times, it's like what I told Tasha, what I told Eliana last night. My parents used to tell me that this, that things didn't go on the way they go on today when, when we were kids. My parents used to say that to me. Well, it's funny because I'm saying it to my kids. This never, this never existed when I was a kid. This wasn't real. You know, and I talked to Eliana about stuff like that last night. You know, you have to stand upon your faith and be a rock. And one, I told, you know, told her she has to choose to believe what we believe, obviously. You know, I can't force her to believe this. And as she gets older, she's going to have to make many different choices. But it's our desire that she makes the correct choices. But you see the world around you. The same thing is happening here in this parasha with Egypt. The mixed multitude. Things were changing, and God had to intervene. God had to intervene without the, without the help of the children of Israel. I mean, they had no choice. The children of Israel, they were just going to follow what God was doing. God was going to do this. You were going to follow it, or you weren't going to follow it. It's the concept of, uh, of uh, Abraham's nephew Lot. You know, God, God was... True to Abraham. God told Abraham that he would not destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, but for one righteous. He said, I will not destroy it, but for one righteous. He was 100% true. He was. The, the, the way he got around it was he told that righteous to get out of the city. <laughs> he said, if you find one righteous there, will you not destroy it? If I find but one righteous, I will not destroy it. He found one righteous and he kicks him out of the city so he could destroy it. Because we don't want that, God does not want that in the earth. He would not destroy the righteous is what God was saying. You're 100% right. I will not destroy the righteous among the wicked. I will not remove the wheat and the tares without separating them first. I will not throw the wheat into with the chaff. I will separate the wheat and the chaff. 
I will separate the sheep and the goats. I will put the righteous on one side and the wicked on another. And I will totally obliterate the abominations that are to me. The reality is God is in control of this, all of this, our life, our world, everything around about us. God is in control of it. Sometimes we believe we're in control. Sometimes we believe we're out of control and we can't do anything about it. And the reason we feel that we're out of control is because we're trying to control it. When you try to control something and you feel like things are slipping, you start to feel like you yourself have issues. I'm out of control. I can't control this. I don't know what the heck is going on, blah, blah, blah. Well, the problem you don't know what is going on is because you're not supposed to be in control. God is supposed to be in control. Here, God does take control. He literally tells Moshe, go to Pharaoh, come to Pharaoh, Bo. Tell him that I'm going to release these signs upon them and then see what happens. So he keeps hardening Pharaoh's heart and hardening Pharaoh's heart and these things start to happen. We're in a world where we're inundated with the things that we never would have thought. Things or time is speeding up and the reason time is speeding up is because we have access to everything going on in the world. The slower you consume information, the slower time is. The faster you consume information, the faster time is. It's, it's crazy. And if I go on the internet, have you, has anyone ever been on their phone, on the internet, on their computer, and watching television at the same time? I do it all the time, right? Who doesn't? I'm on my phone checking things, I'm on the internet, and, and the TV's on. I'm consuming information. All that information is going I'm trying to consume it, and time is speeding up. That's why you have to back off, give your time, give yourself a Shabbat, rest. Rest from the ways and the things of the world. Escape from all the things that are going on around about you. Rest in the peace of God. And really give Him time to tell you what He's controlling in your life. If, if we don't do that, we're going to think we're continuing, continually in control. And we're going to continue to do things that God doesn't want us to do. We're going to continue to walk in a path that God hasn't ordained for us. We have to sit back and let God ordain our steps and order them up. Otherwise, we are going to ultimately realize failure. And then we're not going to understand why we failed. We say, well, Lord, I thought you were, you know, going to take care of this. And Lord, I thought you were. And and he said, well, you never gave me the opportunity. We, We have to recognize what's going on around about us. We have to understand that we're in the world and not of it. We're part of the world, but we're not of the world. So we have to separate ourselves from the world. But at the same time, we have to be in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy dynamic that has to occur. You have to still farm. You can do nothing. You have to farm. You have to go into your field and plant seed. You have to water that seed and let it grow. You have to, that's part of life. That's, you know, the first part of the fall was Adam got, you know, banished from the, from God Eden. And when he was banished from God Eden, he said, you will work by the sweat of your brow for the rest of your life. What does that mean? And all your children after you will work by the sweat of your brow. That means that you will continually have to work hard for what you, what you yield. You'll have to do that. So that's, That's normal. That's not necessarily being part of the world. There's a confusion here. A lot of people believe that, you know, going out and working hard and doing this and that, that's being part in the world. And, you know, Christians will back off. Even Jews will back off and they won't go, you know, have a job. They'll just study Torah all day long. And they'll let other people feed them. The church the synagogue, the state of Israel. 
I mean, there's a whole community in Israel of, of, of Haredi Jewish people that they don't work. The state pays their lives. All they do all day long is study Torah. And the state of Israel pays for them to live and their families. And they all have like 20 kids. That's not, that's not reality. That's not, being, that's not annexing yourself from the world. That's not being not part of the world. What that's doing is saying that you don't have to because you're in the presence of God. But so was Adam. In fact, I would argue that Adam was closer to God than any one of us has ever been. Adam walked with God in the garden. And after Adam fell, God still spoke to him for sure. I'm sure God still spoke to him. The same way he spoke to the prophets, the same way he spoke to... I mean, we don't know that because no, no scripture really says. But we know that he spoke to his children, specifically Cain. Where is your brother? Who's my brother? And Cain responds to God like it's normal to have a conversation. You know, in the scriptures he shows a response which is a completely normal response like you're having a conversation back and forth with someone else. That suggests that it was normal to hear from God. So we're in this world around us that is in absolute disarray. It's completely different, and it's increasingly getting more and more wicked. Things are becoming more and more acceptable. We're consuming information faster, and so the consumption of that information makes us have seared consciences. You, st you see things more and more and more, and so it becomes normal to you. These are not normal things. This is not what God wants of us. And I, you know, I was telling my, my daughter last night, what's not normal? And I took the scriptures and explained them. And some of these scriptures I used were very adult. But I had to make an expression. I had to make a, a point to her of what God's command is. And so we continue to guide and direct our, our families and our friends into the truth so that we can see Olam Haba in the future. In Exodus chapter 17, which is Beshalach, if you continued reading, which I did because you know 10 to 13 was the parashah for this week, but if you continued to read into Beshalach, which typically you do if you, if you kind of are into what you're reading, there's an interesting part here where Moshe says to Joshua, choose out men. So they're about to fight this, this, this army, the army of Amalek. And God says to Moses to tell Joshua to choose men. And then he says, the Lord says to Moses something interesting. In verse 13, 14. Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. He said, for I will utterly put out. He's not saying that Joshua will or his people will. He's saying he will do it. And Moses built an altar and called the name of the altar Yahweh Nisi, for he said, because of the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation to generation. He says the Lord will have war with Amalek. It's interesting because if you are in this time, you would think to yourself, well, these people are having war with these people. The U.S. is going to war with Iran. The, you know, the the uh, Iranians are going to, Iranians are going to war with, you know, Israel. The Russians are going to war with Ukraine. The, you know, they're saying man to man. But this one, even though Israel, the children of Israel, Joshua and his men are going to fight from generation to generation, it says this is the Lord's war. This isn't a man's war, this is God's war. I remember when we were fighting in Iraq, many people said, I won't fight this man's war. President Bush, when he went to war the first time around, he said, I won't fight this man's war because it was, in their mind, Bush's war. It wasn't God's war. But God's making a point here that I will utterly 
destroy and wipe them from the planet. And this is his goal, and he will use these men as his tool. But from the moment that the children of Israel left Egypt, that we see in this parasha, until this very day in the world that we live in and we witness today, God has not allowed Israel to live without engaging these myriad emotions of fear and anger and confusion and pain and reliance on Him and ultimately giving up their self-will to God. They've always had to have this feeling of on the edge, am I where I'm supposed to be? And looking toward God. You see this in modern examples, this modern examples of the resilience. How many of us know that we just experienced the Shoah memorial? Right? The memorial of the Shoah. Everybody knows that the Holocaust existed. Most people in the world believe it was real. There's a few, you know, numbskulls that think that it wasn't real, which is ridiculous to even think about. But we just experienced this Shoah, this Holocaust memorial period. You can say that this was a period of resilience and determination for the people of Israel, or you can say that it was judgment from God, which a lot of Christians do, which is absolutely mind-blowing that they call this the judgment of God because they rejected Yeshua. Do you honestly think that God wants to kill His people because they reject Him? The Scriptures don't say that. What they do say is that he wants to share with them his truth. And he'll go to, the, to, to great lengths to bring them into his pastures. The scripture says that the shepherd will leave the 99 for the one. To go get the one. Not leave the 99 to go shoot the one in the back of the head. It's a, it's, the mindset of the world, the way we have put things into context is crazy. God wants the people, but this period of time, was it in the hands of God? Was it not in the hands of God? It was in the hands of God. This was man, not God who did this. The Bible strictly says, and we'll read here in a second from Scripture, that God does not tempt. There's no variableness in God. He does not tempt you. So we'll see that here in a minute. But they have to go through these experiences. But they war, uh, they've been warring for centuries and centuries through the Crusades, through the Inquisitions, through the Holocaust, through getting back the land in the Belfort Treaty, through warring uh, in the Six-Day War to gain Jerusalem again, through terrorism that we see and we experience all the time uh, in Israel, uh, even today, and, you know, this Iranian struggle and problem that they see today, which is another problem. The reality has been, unless we give up our own will, unless the people of Israel, unless you and I, unless all of us give up our own will to rely solely on God's protection, we're ultimately going to fail in battle. And when you think about battle, I'm not talking about you going out and carrying guns. and I'm talking about the spiritual battle that's inside of you. That struggle that happens inside. We will fail if we don't give to God. It doesn't matter how great our self-determination is or our resilience to overcome in the face of adversity. What ultimately matters is what God has destined and allotted for us as a result of our submission to Him. Today's parasha is a staging ground. It's a staging ground for us to understand how the Lord desires a people that rely on Him amid the trials and amid the storms of life. All the things that go on around about you God desires for you to rely on Him. They literally, the children of Israel, literally could do nothing. God sent the locust. God sent the blood. God sent the death to the firstborn. God sent the darkness and the blight. God sent the lice, the, play, the frogs. He sent the plagues. They did nothing. They just sat there and waited for Him to say, move. They had to relinquish control, and Moshe had to stand on his, in his, uh, his strength as a leader to encourage them to wait. God is moving, wait. 
When it was dark outside and no one could see, literally the, 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 the Talmud translates uh, this period of time where no one could see in front of their nose, meaning that it was so black that you couldn't see anything. God darkened all of Egypt that you couldn't see even before your nose. If someone was standing right in front of you, the Talmud says that you couldn't see the person standing directly in front of you, except for the beauty of it all, except for in the community of the people of Israel. It was light. They could see. I can't even imagine that. I mean, imagine that, that, that experience. God was in total control and God protected them and took care of them. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13 says, Brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moshe in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Mashiach, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Here in Corinthians, we hear them talking that Yeshua was there with them in the wilderness. And they drank of Him, ate of Him. He was there with them. The Messiah was protecting them. Literally, they said that they were baptized unto Moshe in the cloud and in the sea, and they all drank the same spiritual meat and the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Yeshua. Basically, what we're hearing here is that the Messiah saved the people of Israel even back in Moshe's time. Yeshua, the Messiah that we know, he came also and saved the children of Israel from Pharaoh. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it were, was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, and some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. That fornication of the golden calf. Worshipping foreign gods. Allowing the way of the world around you to come in and creep in. My daughter came home from school the other day, and she says to me, I started art class. It's a new quarter. I said, okay, that's awesome. You're going to be excited about that. She goes, yeah. She goes, tomorrow we have to draw Egyptian gods. I said, excuse me? She goes, we have to draw Egyptian gods. I said, you're not drawing Egyptian gods. She goes, okay. She obviously doesn't care. She goes, okay. She goes, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to not do it, and, I, and I'm going to call your school. That's unacceptable. To make you call, draw foreign gods. And she goes, well, you can give me a note. I'll be glad to give it to my teacher. That's what she says. I said, no, we'll email her tonight. So we emailed the teacher the next day, that, that night. But that concept, even that concept is searing the conscience of our children. Searing the conscience. Which is interesting, it's even at this time, it's at this parasha. She's learning about these Egyptian gods at this period of time, this period when Pharaoh... I mean, there's, there's something beautiful that God is actually moving and teaching her, you know. But then she went in and the teacher pulled her aside and the teacher says to her... Well, could you draw, you know, I, I got your note from your parents, it's okay. Could you draw pyramids or, like, you know, things, things like that? And she looks at her and she says, no, my parents won't be good with that. <laughs> so she drew Looney Tunes. While everyone else is drawing Egyptian gods, she's drawing Looney Tunes. Because that's about what this was, it was Looney Tunes.
But, you know, we could have said, we could have said it's no big deal. It's just school. They're being educated about history. We read about Egyptian gods. We have to. We have to study it in our own Bible. We could have said it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Because you're, you're making a, a, almost a graven image of sorts of a foreign god. And that's not what we do. And even Eliana goes, well, she needs to draw our God. I said, how do you draw an invisible God, uh, Tasha? How do you draw an invisible God? You can't. There's no image of God. He's invisible, and he's omnipotent, and omniscient, and he's greater than all. You can't draw that. So the things in the world are going to creep in, and they can continue. I mean, I don't ever remember drawing Egyptian gods or even talking about them. I walked into her history class. Her entire history class is covered with Ra. Ra is everywhere. The entire room is full of Egyptian artifacts and Ra. And she learns in history because her teacher loves the Egyptian culture. She learns all about Ra, the sun god and the pharaohs, how they were gods on earth in history class. And so I have to be at home and reiterating that this is all falsehood. And she's like, Dad, I already know it's fake gods. But she's too young for that influence in my head. But even if you pull her out and you put her into a Christian school, she's going to get the same thing. Her education is going to be just as weird. But that's the point. You have these, this scripture here that talks to us about fornicating with the world around us. And in Corinthians, Paul's talking about fornicating with the world around us and the things that are going on around the world. And he's telling us, don't do it. Don't be tempted. Neither let tempt Yeshua, he says, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. They tempted God himself and they were destroyed. Neither murmur, he says. Do not have a Lashon Hara. This is a big, huge concept in this parasha. An evil tongue. Neither murmur, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all of these things happened unto them for examples. That's another trend. Uh, that's another interesting fact. All of these happen to, all these things happen to them for examples. It's the same thing that happened to Egypt, to, to the Pharaoh. They used God used him as an example. God is also using the children of Israel in the wilderness. Anyone that that blatantly rejects who God is will be used as an example. That's the point. So here, he's using them for examples. And now all these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. It's interesting. Mom says in the prayer this morning, if you were listening, she said, in these last days. We've been hearing that for 100 years, in these last days. And we could say to ourselves that... Uh, these aren't the last days. Time will continue. I'll continue to get up and put my pants on one leg at a time and go to work and do this. I have time. But it's funny because when your conscience becomes so seared, the scriptures tell us that people will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. And then the bridegroom will come. That literally tells us that the world will be acting as normal. He will happen upon us. He will happen upon us without even knowing that he's going to happen upon us. Things around us will be normal and we will not assume or think that anything is crazy. Some people will see things and you'll have signs of the times that are going on around you. But yet you will still be doing the normal things that you do. You'll still be waking up in the morning and thinking about your to-do list. What will I do today? You'll still be doing that. You're going to get in the car and you're going to drive to the grocery store because you've got to feed your children. All those things will happen. 
It will still go on, but then all of a sudden, the sky will split, the earth will shake, and a Mashiach will arrive. You do not know the time, the hour. We don't know when it is, but yet we do allow the world around us to make us, to sear our conscience from awaiting him. From recognizing that his coming is imminent. There's a, there was a, 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 a song we watched yesterday on the, on the YouTube, a, a Jewish guy singing it at Migdal David, and there's a, t -sh a sweatshirt that said Bo Yeshua on it. Ziva says, what does Bo Yeshua mean? I said, it means come Yeshua, because we want the Messiah to return. And she goes, ooh, I want one of those. I want one of those shirts. To recognize that the, the Messiah should come every night, to recognize every day that the Messiah is on his, on the, on, you know, even at the door. That's the concept of we're in the last days. And when the day comes that you're no longer with us on the earth, that was the day the Mashiach returned. You have one chance. You have one opportunity. And that's this time in life. So yes, it's very short. And you never know. Kobe Bryant. We all just went through that. That was a strange environment. That was a strange period. The whole world, almost like, I mean, especially in the United States, mourned this guy. I mean, it was very odd. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a celebrity get treated the way he was treated after his death. Maybe Elvis, but I didn't see Elvis because I'm old. I'm not, I'm not that old. Joy. I didn't, you know, I don't, I've never seen that. It was weird. And, and the funny thing is, is that I didn't even watch basketball. I don't watch sports. I know Kobe Bryant. Everybody says he was awesome and he was so great. And to me, it's just Michael Jordan because when I was a kid, I used to watch Michael Jordan. But then I grew up and stopped watching sports, Brian. But you have these guys, you have these experiences where you have these people. But you know what happened? That affected me crazy. When I heard about that guy's death, I actually started to feel a mourning. It was hard. It was strange. And maybe it was his daughter. Maybe it was because he had his little daughter with him. And, it, you know, he, I can't imagine. And started thinking about what was going on in the helicopter just before they die. And how he's trying to probably console her. And, I mean, what a disaster that, that had to have been. But, you know, 41 years old, maybe that's what it is. It's really close to my age. You know, so it affected me because he's so close to my age. But then I started thinking about the fact that this guy's career was over, really. He retired. He was done. He achieved everything. He, he maximized his career by the time he was 41 years old. He was completely maximized. He reached the peak of his life by the time he was 41 years old. He had nothing else to look forward to in his own personal career. Now everything he was going to do for the rest of his life was give back. His time, time went so fast for him. It was almost like it was over anyway. It was over anyway. And the funny thing is, is I saw this, this news article that, or whatever that said that he told his, one of his friends, I don't know the guy's name, Brian knew who it was, but said that... Uh, Kobe Bryant used to say that he wanted to die young all the time. He wanted to be immortalized. He said he always would say, I want to die young. I want to be immortalized. What a moron. I mean, the moment I heard it, I, I, I responded, I'm going to live forever. Who says things like that? Then it happens. That's what's crazy. Then it happens. You don't know when the Mashiach is returning for you. That's why it is the last days. Every single day, you know, it's almost, you know, those Baptist preachers back in the day that used to stand up there and say, you know, do you know if you're going to leave this parking lot and get in a car accident, you better accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You never know when the last day, I mean, there's a little bit of truth in that. 
It's not the right way to minister the gospel of Yeshua, that he's the Mashiach, I don't think. I don't think that's how people get saved. I think that's how people get scared, and then they accept because of their fear, not because they desire it. God doesn't want people to lack the desire for him. God wants people that want to truly be in his presence and know him. This is why the rabbis in Judaism reject you three times when you come to them. If you go to a rabbi in Judaism and you say, I want to become Jewish and you want to convert, the rabbi will say, no, you can't. Please move on. That same person will come back again. I want to convert. I, need to, I, I, I know this is who I'm supposed to be. Please go help me through the process. Nope. Move on. Is the rabbi rejecting them? All along, every time the rabbi says to that person who wants to convert, every single time, they're inside thinking to themselves, I hope they return. I hope they come back. The third time that person comes to the rabbi to ask to convert, guess what? He says, now you're ready because you truly are telling me, you're proving to us, you're proving to God that you truly want to be one of his children, the people of Israel, because it is a beautiful thing. You're ready to come into the presence of God and learn his ways. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Christianity, you could, you know, you could say, you know, you're going to die tomorrow and you know, you need to accept Jesus. The person accepts Jesus and everybody throws a huge party for him like they're, like they're okay. Everybody, that, rather than saying, do you really understand who you're to be now? That's why there's so much diversity in the faith. That's why there's so much mixing in this, in this, in this world, in, in the faith and the belief of Yeshua HaMashiach. There's so many different ideas because you could be, you know, they, they all come from wherever and they don't have any guidance to who they should be. Relinquishing yourself to God, humbling yourself before Him, that's the key to learning who He is. But you have to desire to humble yourself before God. You have to desire to meet God and know God. You can't just, you can't just say, oh, now I'm a Christian, or now I'm a believer, or now I'm a Jewish person, and then think that it's going to work out. You have to be seeking. Seek and the door will be open to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you, right? The parasha today displays the miracles that God performed to reveal His sovereignty over the earth. That's another point. God was making a point to Pharaoh who supposedly was God on earth. Little g to all these people around him. God was making a point to the world. Okay, you have this little G here, this little Pharaoh, but look, I'm going to send locusts to devour your fields. All the trees will be destroyed. All the fruit will be consumed. The locusts will be here. Remember the time that we had just a few years ago, a couple years ago with the cicadas? Remember? You wake up in the middle of the night, you wake up in the morning and you go outside and it sounds like an alien invasion. I mean, everywhere, it was literally the most frightening feeling on the planet. These, got, these things are everywhere. They're all over the place, and they're consuming and destroying. God's making a point. I'm sovereign over the world. If I tell the cicadas to come eat your, eat your fields, they'll come eat your fields. If I tell the, the river to turn red, I, it turns red. And nothing that little G on earth does can stop me who's sovereign over the earth. We see the sovereignty of God in Egypt as he forces the Egyptian pharaoh to let Israel go. It's very important. It continues as the cloud leads them through the wilderness of the Red Sea. Then as God dries the sea and destroys the armies of Pharaoh. In Israel's search for water, God allows the rocks to weep. The people complain of not having food to eat as they reflect upon the flesh pots of Egypt and God allots them their portion daily from raining down upon them. Uh, for food, for sustenance. All of these things happened as a result of God's direction and the movement of His hand. The people were crying out. They were murmuring about neglect and how God has brought them to the wilderness to die. But we have seen that God allowed for this experience, perhaps in order to trial the people and test their resilience, their reliance on Him. But does God test people? Is He allowing you to be tested now in your life? 1 Corinthians says that there is no temptation that is not common to man. 
No man has experienced a trial or temptation so unique that every other man has not come un into contact with the self-same experience. We like to think that our situations and our circumstances in life are unique and that they're special because it makes us feel unique and special. But there are, there are and there were men and women that currently and prior to this life are experiencing the exact same trials, storms, and circumstances that we do now. We hear it all the time. Well, you don't understand what I'm going through. As if it's a unique experience. People in the, throughout the whole world have experienced the same unique situation you're experiencing. There's no temptation, there's no trial, there's no storm that's common to anyone. The only thing that's, that's, that, that, that's unique for you is you yourself are uniquely made by God. So the way you experience it in your mind and in your heart is unique. But the events it's, themselves are not. The scripture provides us with all the possible angles that temptation can take with us. Each shape and form is outlined and colorfully painted for us to see and hear so that we may know how to respond when we come face to face with the wiles of the enemy. James, a servant of God and the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, he says, greetings. He's talking to the twelve tribes and by that time the twelve tribes were already scattered. They didn't know who they were, but they were scattered, right? So he's talking to them abroad, and he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James states that the trials work patience in our lives, and what do trials make us patient for? I believe he means that trials create the patience required to wait upon God for our needs to, point, to the point that we end up wanting nothing and appreciating everything we receive because we had no expectation of the receipt of that blessing. When you receive something that you didn't expect, you're so much more happy and engaged with that, with that blessing. If you expect something and you get it, you're not thankful for it. I notice that with my children. My, my, my daughter, I give, I, I give a little lesson to my kids that when they lose their teeth, they know where the tooth fairy And Those of you who saw that thing on Facebook, which is hilarious, it's Eva did, but she'll tell us, Dad, I uh, lost my tooth, so it's under my pillow, and uh, I'll be expecting money tomorrow. So I don't ever carry cash, and I don't ever go to the ATM, and I always tell Tasha, we got to get to the ATM because, you know, they lost a tooth. And I turn it, because we forget to go to the ATM, I turn it into a lesson, a life lesson, a business lesson. The longer you leave your tooth under your pillow, it appreciates in value. So how many days would you like it to stay under your pillow? Because you get X amount of dollars every single day. How much do you want to make? It's appreciating in value. It's your asset. So Ziva's like, hmm, okay, I, I, want, to, I want to make this much. Okay, well, you have to wait that many days. Okay, well, okay, I'll wait. It's, it's worth it. And invariably she comes and she says, Dad, I think I'm ready. And it's before that time because she just wants to have her hands on the cash, right? She wants to, she wants to pull her investment early. And I tell her, you sure you want to do that? You're going to make more money. And I'm pushing her because I don't have any cash on me. All along I know that this is stupid because I should just go to the ATM and d d handle it. But it's cute, and it's fun, and it gives us a little thing to do, and she makes a little bit of extra money she can spend on some lip balm, okay? The point is that when she went up to the room to see if her money was there, she come downstairs, she goes, my teeth were gone. What happened to my teeth? I said, well, was the money there? Well, it doesn't matter what happened to my teeth. And 
the, the funny thing is she expected the money, so there was no gratefulness for it. She expected that. There was a reward, right? If you, if, listen, you told me that this is what I expected, so I don't know why I should be grateful. When you expect nothing, your gratefulness is huge. When you receive something, it's a completely different feeling. When you expect it, it's just like, yeah, okay, thanks. You know, I wanted Ziva to just like be ecstatic and say, oh, awesome. Yeah, no, she was like, yeah, yeah, I got the money. That's not the point. The point is, where's my teeth? It's the same idea here that James is trying to say and, and that God is trying to teach us. Trials will either increase your reliance on God, ultimately destroying your expectations, or decrease your reliance on God and cause you to foster your own expectations. God is working to move in our lives, but because we have so many expectations, we view anything that is contrary to that expectation as a trial against our goals. The question we must be asking one another is, why do our goals not align to God's? If something's not going the way you expect it to go, ask yourself, why does this not align with what God wants? Because if God wanted it, it would happen that way. If God wanted this to occur, it would happen that way. If this was God, it would already happen. The problem is we set our own expectations. And then when things don't happen the way we want, we, we question God and say, why would you do this to me? And God says, well, this wasn't what I planned in the first place. And I'm sorry you set your own expectation, but it's not my plan for you. My plan is different. And the only way you can know his plan is by stepping back, relying on him, being thankful and grateful for what we have, and move on. If we take each day as its own and allow God to move as he wills, then when we are blessed, we are appreciative and awed by his wonder and mercy. But if we enter the day with expectation and that expectation is not satisfied, then our faith will be tried by the enemy because our expectation, though it may be honest and good and just, is in fact our weakness. Our expectations make us weak. And then the enemy uses our weakness our own expectation as a tool to create doubt and force us to question God himself, to make our own choices outside of his predestined will for our lives. Let no man say, and we'll end right here, but let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. It says that in James. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. His own expectation. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He is in charge of it all. This time, this life that we live, this experience that we go through, everything that we experience is as a result of his hand. We have to be appreciative, thankful for what he is providing us. Whether he's, provi whether he's pulling us from the Egyptian pharaoh's hands, taking us into a wilderness, feeding us manna or water from a rock, whatever that may be, it is his, it is his decision. It is his choice. He makes the cho choice and we just follow. We're his servants. Amen? Amen? It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands, has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the King of kings, the Holy One, 
Blessed is he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation in the seat of his glory is in the heavens above and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He's our God, there's none other. True is our king. There's nothing beside him as it is written in his Torah. You shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below there is none other.
Give us for being led astray, oh God, for being unfaithful to you. Father God, we believe in your name. Believe in the power of your blood. We believe in salvation, Father. We believe in the stories of the Bible. The stories in your Torah, Father God, we believe them, Lord. We come today, Lord, that ask, and ask that you would help our unbelief, Father. Help the moments of our doubt. The moments that we question who you are. Question if you hear us, if you see us, if you're real. Father, forgive us for this flesh, Father God. Forgive us for the mundane thoughts of life that draw us away from you. Lord, we seek, Father God, your face. Lord, we seek to your blood upon our doorposts. Lord, help us to not take these stories lightly, Father God, and the, the truths that you bring forth, Father. Help us not to take them lightly. Help us to believe in them. Help us to walk by them, to live by them, to fight for them to be protected by them, Father. So Lord, I just ask and pray that you would take your coals today in this place. As we stand before your throne, Father God, that you would cleanse us, make us righteous, make us holy. In your eyes, Father. Amongst all the distractions that are in our minds, in our lives, Lord, we as a people, Father God, come before you as one and ask that you would anoint us, Father. Anoint us with the holiness of a righteousness that belongs to your Son. For we worship you, Father. Yeshua, we praise you. We accept you, your blood. Forgive us for our lone times. Forgive us for our times of doubt, times of distraction, Father. We seek the rare times of your presence, Father, the times of uh, intimacy with you. Help us be a people that seek that. Help us to be a people that seek your face, your presence, above all else. For nothing in this life, in this world, can compare to you. No love, no possession, nothing, Father. So, Lord, help us to step away from us help us to give 
Help us to love Decrease us, Father God, that you may increase in our lives, in our hearts, and our spirits. Help us to seek time with you this week. Help us to run to it, to cleave to it, Father God. To be desperate for it, Father. For there is none like you. There is none like you, Father. Adonai Sevaot. Come, come and move in us, Father. We invite that. Lord, I ask that you bless this Shabbat as we continue in fellowship and in prayer and that you just move among us, Father God, that you cause your shalom, your peace to be felt in this place. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this community. We thank you for this leadership, Father God. This very building, this very land, Father, we thank you for it, Lord. We may be small in number, Father God, but we are dedicated to you. We are set apart by you, Father. Bless this day, Father God. Bless all who are here, who, all who are sick and are not here with us physically, Father God. I ask that you would extend to them as well. Watch over our children this week, Father God. Protect them, keep them safe from everything. We praise you. We thank you. In Yeshua's name we say. Maybe see it for quick announcements. As always, please check the back table. We have CDs of today's message. Also, I know we're two months away, but uh, it's never too early to start preparing for Pesach. Um, our annual uh, Pesach dinner will be April 8th, which is Wednesday evening. Um, so we're going to start the sign-up list next week. Uh, so if you just, you know, think, think about who's coming with you. Uh, if you have to talk to people, talk to friends, family, whatever it might be, uh, you can start thinking about that, and then we'll have the sign-up list uh, next week. Um, I know that Kathleen, where did you go? You were in the back. <laughs> um, since uh, the last time we tried to plan a breakfast theme for Oneg, we had can it got canceled. Um, we decided I decided to go ahead and do it next week. So next week is a breakfast theme. If you guys are all interested in that, um, we're going to do that. So whatever you decide to bring, you just pray and ask God to uh, help you decide what you want to bring for that. Okay, that's it like a breakfast theme. All right, uh, just a reminder, there's a docket box and backs for uh, ties, offerings, donations. One side here to the left is your praise reports and prayer request. As we go into Oneg, let's say the bracha together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lech amin haaretz b'ashem Yeshu hamashiach. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the land. Name Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Shavuot Tov.